before I start uh, with this presentation, I just want to say a few, just a few words about me. Most of you know that I'm a PhD student at the Valras Pareto Center in the University of Lausanne. Um, I'm writing up my thesis at the moment in a difficult condition, obviously. Uh, but I, I work on the history of consumption, uh, the history of theories of consumption in American economics, uh, mostly uh, by the end of the 19th century and early 20th, 20th century. Um, and my thesis really is about how the object of consumption, the subject of consumption was neglected and obscured for several reasons I show in, in my chapters and uh, how uh, notably, this is one contribution of my thesis, of my thesis how notably uh, uh, some women uh, maverick economists actually took up the question of consumption and consumer uh, behavior in, um, into their expertise and uh, uh, how it was actually a forgotten story. So this is really about my thesis, but um, I'm also really interested in uh, reflexive uh, literature and behavioral economics. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really interested in philosophy of economics and methodology as well. So this is a subject that will uh, kind of mix things I know, things I work on. And uh, I hope you guys uh, learn th something and, uh, and uh, have fun. So to start with, I just want to, um, to bring you this not debate. This was not a debate because those two people did not actually talk about this subject. But in 1953, you had on one hand Milton Friedman, of course you know, um, who advocated that the realism of a theory's assumption is irrelevant. Only the predictive power of the theory matters. Uh, he wrote this uh, approximately this. I rewrote it, I rephrased it, uh, the method in the methodology of positive economics in 1953. Uh, Milton Friedman, of course, you know, is uh, someone who was um, an advocate of uh, liberal free market and uh, who was quite uh, uh, known for his uh, 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 public policy uh, with uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and all that. So, very famous man. And George Katona, who was a, a psychologist uh, not an economist, but who was very interested in economics, said that economic theory can be improved with psychology. Economic problems are best addressed with realistic assumptions in this famous article in 1953. So you had, you had these two positions, uh, quite opposite position, rather opposite. And uh, the first one arguing assumption, are, assumption realistic assumptions are irrelevant. We shouldn't care about them. And George Katona, who belonged, I'll talk about this later, but who belonged to the old behavioral economics, who's a pioneer of what we know today as behavioral economics. And uh, I'll talk about it later. So just to give you a quick glimpse of how old is this issue, this problematic, of, uh, this problematic debate of realistic assumption. And of course, you can go back even, um, even earlier than that. So these are the four questions I want to ask, I want to raise in this talk. Uh, the first one is what, just basically, what is a realistic assumption in economics? The second one is, is why does it matter? Why, does it, why do we even care about this subject? Uh, if people like Friedman can say we don't care, why should we care? How behavioral economics became associated with it, with the idea of a realistic science economic science. And the fourth question, why behavioral economics, economics approach is problematic regarding realism? And I will talk to you in a second uh, what I mean by realism. So very briefly, what is a theory in economics? Just a quick epistemological question here I want to, I want to get uh, settled. Um, a theory in economics, you, you can, it's a big word. You can, you can mean many different things when you talk about theory. You can, you can talk about the big economic theory, which is economics. You can talk about the neoclassical, neoclassical theory, which is a school of thought. And you can talk about smaller theories, like the nudge theories, the, the 
the, the, the Keynesian theories, you can talk about small things. Um, an, an economic theory, this is Schumpeter, I mean, of uh, 1954, uh, who said you have actually two aspects of the economic theory. You have an explanatory hypothesis, like in many other sciences, you, to start with a theory, you, you, to start with knowledge, you just ask, okay, I want to, I want to put, uh, to, brow, to, to bring in uh, an explanatory hypothesis, and then I can work on it. In economics, the second aspect is more, more important. Economic theory is considered as a box of tool. It's something much uh, bigger. Uh, it's something that you don't need to prove in itself. It's something that you don't need to, to prove because it's interesting in itself, but because uh, you can do something else with that. You can manipulate, you can reason with this. Like the Keynesian theory, the Keynesian theory it's a box of, of tools. You have different concepts. And Schumpeter would say you have different gadgets. You have the law of propensity. You have many different things. So in the end, economic theory is not a unified body of knowledge. You know that. And uh, this is the quotation from George Stigler, the Chicagoan economist. Perhaps no other science receives as much criticism from both its own members and outsiders as does economics. Economics is really, really plural. It's a plural discipline. You don't have one, two, three uh, different uh, schools. You have many different orthodox, heterodox, different schools. So what I mean by realism, um, so the, the, quick, the, quick, the quick chat we had uh, before, before the, uh, the talk, uh, the beginning of the talk, um, led me to think that we don't, we, we must um, get the word realism, uh, uh, the good definition. Uh, what I mean here by realism is not the big philosophical realism uh, we can sometimes hear, like the, the ontological realism, the epistemological realism, all of those concepts, th those expressions that uh, say um, there exists an independent existence of idea, of knowledge, whatever, uh, separated from, from us, which is the opposite of idealism. And this is not the definition I will use here. I will just use the definition of a realistic assumption, which define how accurate a description of a phenomenon is. In economics, this debate is focused on the plausibility of the economic behavior represented in a theory or a model. So the issue of realism is essentially focused on this. So when you talk about realistic assumptions, you can have basically three views. You can argue with them. Maybe, maybe uh, I, I just I just uh, thought about it, but maybe uh, maybe you can find another kind of pro-realism. But these are ideal, uh, typic, uh, typical uh, views. You have the pro-realism, which basically says realism of assumption matters. Uh, we should have more accurate models, theory at various degree, but for example, institutionalist behavioral economics, uh, institutionalist like Veblen, for example, he said that, uh, or today, Daniel Kenman, Richard, Richard Fader, they would say that. Uh, the second view would be the soft anti-realism. What matters, they would say, what matters is at the aggregate level. Therefore, we do not need more than a representative agent or consumer that resembles most people. This is the, the most common view in neoclassical economics. This is the view that would advocate uh, Alfred Marshall, for example, the, the classical English economist. The third view would be the strong anti-realism. Realism for judging the quality of a theory, what matters is its predictive power. So you can recognize uh, Milton Friedman's uh, argument here. So this is a minor position. Some neoclassicals would defend this, but the second one is the biggest at the moment. So of course, um, when you think about realism, the naive view would say, why is there a, even a debate? Of course, more realism is better, right? Uh, uh, it's some kind of a natural thinking to say, um, 
of course it's better than something that doesn't resemble because you you can you can sense something uh, about the fact that it's going to be a better theory you, you you don't know how to explain it but maybe you disagree but i would say so so why you would bother care about it so this is something i found maybe some of you know tell me if you do it's uh, um, a fake description by George Luis Borges, the, uh, uh, the writer from Argentina, who wrote this fake uh, text from a fictional Sir Ares Miranda. And he basically said, I'll let you read it if you'd like, but he basically said uh, that a very, um, an empire from a, a very distant uh, place attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire the entirety of a province and, and so on and so forth and at the end um, basically the the size of the map was exactly the same size as the the empire so they wanted to add so much detail to the map that they ended up with a map as big as their uh, empire and in the end in all the land there, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. They went too far in details. I want to, what I want to say here is that too much details goes against the very aim of what a model or a theory is about, being something easy to use that is more convenient to manipulate than the outside world itself. This is the parsimony principle. Uh, you, you need to have something easy because it's useless anyway. It's useless in it if it's not the case. So basically, what I want to emphasize here is that a model is something different than just a mere description. A model can be manipulated and is made to be reasoned with, not just looked at. It is a machine that produces or confirms knowledge. This is what it is. So here, this text was uh, brought here to give you a an understanding of why, of course, we're not going to have a detailed study of everything in the world because it's useless. We need to theorize. So this is a case, an example of something I've learned during my research um, on consumption, the debate over consumer behavior in the US, circa 1900. You basically had the marginalists, which were the pioneers of the neoclassical, basically. The marginalists were about the 1817s, 1870s, and neoclassical was a term, a term coined by Thorsten Veblen, actually, who were talking about these guys. And by 1900s, um, uh, we started to use the word neoclassical. But by then, it was the marginalist. So basically, you had on one side the marginalists who would say, people like John Bates Clark, for example, in the US, who would say, well, people, people behave rationally. They know better what is good for themselves. They should not investigate beyond their choice. And this, uh, this account could, in the 1920s, become the revealed preference theory. We don't need to look beyond people's choice because their preferences are revealed in, uh, by, by the, through their choices. The second school by then was the institutionalist. The institutionalist basically says, uh, said like people like Thorsten Veblen, well, people sometimes act irrationally, but we need to understand the true motive of their choices. We need to understand why they behave the way they do. And for that, psychology can help build a better representation of how they behave. So in the US, these, uh, these two schools were not so much opposed and uh, not so much, not one of them was, was really dominant. This, is, this was called the interwar pluralism, the interwar pluralism, uh, which basically says that in the US, it was very difficult to distinguish marginalists from institutionalists because they were all uh, in the same uh, bundle of American progressivism. So what can we learn from this debate over consumer behavior in the US? Well, different basic assumptions 
whether people are rational or not, express different views on what counts at go as good science. For the marginalists or neoclassicals, they were emphasizing objectivity, abstraction, value-free investigation. This is uh, what they thought as good science. For the institutionalists on the other side, they were, uh, they were defending advocacy, empiricism, social control. Uh, they were more inclined with the, the progressive era. So of course, the result of that is that by the 30s, 40s, the neoclassical approach became the dominant one in economics. And uh, if you don't know this book by Mary O. Ferner, Advocacy and Objectivity, this is really a, a, a reading, uh, um, a very good reading, uh, which shows how the American economics uh, changed, transformed itself from this advocacy progressive thing to an objectivity based science. And uh, uh, of course, the advocacy, the objectivity value for investigation today is dominant now, but it was not so clear then. So different basic assumption matters because it expressed different views on what good science is. What I want to do here, am I good? Um, behavioral economics. So apparently some of you know a bit about behavioral economics. Uh, if I go too quickly, you can just ask me some question and by the end of the presentation, I will be, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, two things I want to, to emphasize here. You had basically the old behavioral economics by the 50s and 70s uh, with famous people like Herbert Simon or Josh Katona, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And you had the new behavioral economics. You now have the new behavioral economics approximately since the 1970s. Daniel Kahneman, of course, is one of the famous proponents who won the Nobel Prize, I think, in 2002. And uh, other people like Amo Dversky, his colleague, and uh, Richard Thaler, for example, and many other very famous people. So you basically have, this is what you can find in the history of behavioral economics. You have the old one and the new one. So I'm gonna be a bit, uh, uh, exaggerating uh, those two schools, but basically the first one would say that they they were refusing the neoclassical assumptions and proposed new ones. Uh, it was a very different conception of rationality. The new behavioral economics, it's something that is still debated today, but the new behavioral economics would say we only modify or add some new neoclassical assumptions. Maybe uh, I'll be glad to, to have some uh, uh, divergent opinion uh, by the end, but this is basically what is said today, but this is the common uh, um, explanation of the, of the history of the field today. So the new behavioral economics is closer to neoclassicals than the old one. When you say that, you can look at a definition, a very famous definition of behavioral economics, by Kammerer and Lorenstein, two famous behavioral economists, that says, at the core of behavioral economics is the conviction that increasing the realism of the psychological underpinnings of, economic, of economics analysis will improve economics on its own terms, generating theoretical insights, making better predictions on of field phenomena, and suggesting better policies. You have different things in this definition. First, you have the realism issue. The, the, the aim of the discipline is to increase realism. How to do that? Using psychology. It's about interdisciplinarity. They want to use psychology. And Daniel Kahneman himself was a psychologist, he is a psychologist. The objective of this assumption increasing of realism is to improve the mainstream. It's not to build another radically different economics, uh, economics discipline, but to improve the mainstream, to make better predictions.
Now, what behavioral economics is about? Of course, it's an experimental approach most of the time. There are many different th other things. They use field data, field experiment, computer simulation, brain scan, lots of things, very different things. things. But there's a belief in empirical data, which is a clear departure from what was known as the classical economics of Ricardo, Marshall, and all that. They believe in gathering facts to learn something and to produce knowledge. In 2017, maybe you remember, but you had um, a new Nobel Prize winner in economics, which was called Richard Thaler, one of the two, three most famous behavioral economists. This has increased even more the high popularity and respectability of behavioral economics. And now, today, behavioral economics became the realistic economics, as I call it. Um, it's the part of economics that is interested, that is more interested in homo sapiens rather than homo economicus, uh, more interested in humans rather than econs, uh, more interested in Homer, Sims, Homer Simpson rather than Mr. Spock. This is something you, Richard Thaler, used a lot. Uh, we want to, to study Homer Simpson because people are Homer Simpson and people are not at all Mr. Spock. So it's a very popular new science. If you look at the, the options a policymaker has, from an economic point of view, of course. You have basically three options. First, you can regulate. Take, for example, cigarettes. If you're a government and you want to limit the consumption of cigarettes, what will you do? First, you can regulate, uh, put, uh, use coercion, use bans. You can just make cigarettes uh, forbidden. Secondly, you can use economic incentives. You can use taxes, subsidies, you can have an economic impact on, on the consumption. Or the third one is you can use non-coercive, non-incentivizing guidance, nudging, information, persuasion. Like in many countries today, when you have uh, pictures um, on the, the packets uh, of cigarettes. Nudge, nudging became the popular application of the new realistic economics, this new behavioral economics, which basically says, well, I'm, I'm just going to stay here just one moment. Nudge is basically a concept that was uh, coined by Cass and Shin and Richard Thaler. Maybe I'm sure some of you know about it, but it's basically an application in public policy of behavioral economics. Some very, it's a very, um, they only take one part of behavioral economics, a small one, but it's not entirely behavioral economics. There's also common sense and many other things. Uh, but it's something that was brought in by behavioral economics. Uh, and this has a result. Uh, I'm not saying that behavioral economics has only uh, uh, led to this. There's many other things behavioral economics has led, of course, nudge is only one normative expression of behavioral economics. Uh, behavioral economics has given much more than just nudging, but it's an important part because it's a popular one and people talk, uh, people talk a lot about it. So just to give you um, the issue now with behavioral economics that we can see nudging, are the individual, individual so maybe, maybe I just, uh, just to make sure you understand, because I assume you guys all know what nudge was about, but uh, a nudge is like a, um, a very small, um, very small things like a, like a, a spider in the toilet uh, uh, that uses uh, a psychological mechanism uh, to make people uh, behave in a certain way or to alter preferences. Uh, I didn't put an example, but uh, you can ask me later if you'd like. A, a nudge is any factor that significantly alters the behavior of humans, even though it would be ignored by the ACONS, the Homo economicus. This is their definition. 
So the problem with preferences now, in behavioral economics and especially in nudging, you can see that there's a problem with the fact that we don't know preferences, we don't know individual preferences, and we are um, compelled to assume them, but we don't know whether the model would say we are assuming them, we are deducing them from something you don't know, or we just consider, consider them as revealed by the choice. It's very difficult to know uh, whether preferences are um, rightly understood by the economist. Because since the 1920s or 30s, economists have abandoned the idea of getting behind the choice, getting behind choice, which means um, to understand the motive of choices. The neoclassical adopted the model of revealed preferences, Samuelson model, which means that only choices matter. We don't care about why consumers make the deci their decisions. And you can see that a separate line of research emerged at the same time in the 1930 marketing research, who actually sought to understand consumers' choice, but not to build a theory of consumption to understand the demand uh, or the, um, from an economic standpoint, but to improve firms' production and selling. So you can see how understanding preferences and consumer is something that economics has missed by the, the 20th century and is now starting to regain it with behavioral economics, but in a very strange way and ambiguous way, as I will show you. The second point is, um, well, it's a very complicated, sorry, but idiot savants make rational fools. This is a reference, idiot savants, um, it's reference uh, from a report, an American report, the Koji, C-O-G-E-E, -E, the Koji report in the U.S. in 1991, where um, a cabinet of the government actually made uh, a research on the teaching in America, and they, they actually ended up writing in the report that graduate education in economics had created idiot savants. Uh, so economics, of course, is completely obsessed today with mathematical reasoning, and this has led to, in their terms of in the report, of idiot savants. The rational fools, maybe some of you will uh, get the reference. It's a reference of Amartya Sen's article, famous article, Rational Fools, um, to express how consumer is represented in economics. So idiot savants are the economists, rational fools are the consumer represented in the economic models. Idiot savants cannot make something else than rational fools. What I want to emphasize here is that um, idiot savants make rational fools in the sense that we will not be able to change the model if we keep teaching bad economics, basically. My third point is um, something brought by Gut and Klimt. I think they are uh, close to Gut Giger and there, but I'm not sure. Um, is behavioral economics a neoclassical repair shop helping mainstream economics to um, basically defend itself against these uh, realistic assumption questions? Behavioral economics models today are interested in new ways of understanding preferences and engineers discovered social preferences, but they still rely on the same neoclassical core because these new preferences are just new factors that are treated exactly as a standard. You can disagree with that, um, but this is basically what the reflexive uh, approach to reflexive literature in, in behavioral economics today argue. They still rely on a utilitarianist um, on a utilitarian uh, framework and the goal of the theory remains the same it just it has just implemented new input thanks to the behavioral uh, research the consumer of course is sovereign in economics uh, he knows better what he what he wants to buy what he what he desire and what is good for him, but we know that sometimes he behaves irrationally thanks to behavioral economics. But this has led to a paradox of modern economic theory, in modern economic theory. Models have difficulty to keep together two core ideas uh, 
of economics. First one, the idea that most of the time people will behave rationally, which can be acceptable. We can just uh, start saying, well, people uh, most of the time behave rationally. So uh, uh, the world is, uh, is coherent, rational. It's not constant chaos. This is something that could be defensible um, and that there is a certain logic in human behavior. But in the same time, you cannot say that and say in the same time uh, that such a representation should be the only standard used to build a picture of how the economic world works. This is something else. So the thing is that the idea of rationality as an assumption should remain just an assumption, not an expression of how we see the world. It's like the, the rousseau obesian debate about uh, is human good at the beginning and then society uh, corrupts him. Uh, it's the same, I think it's the same kind of debate. So behavioral economics has demonstrated that people were not always rational, but should economics help them do so with nudging? Here there has been many discussions, both in philosophy of economics, ethics, and methodology. There are also scholars, for example, that argue a Foucauldian moment where be, when behavioral economics help shape homo economicus in the real world in such a way that the model um, would finally resemble reality or that reality would finally resemble the model. So, um, my last point was the, the quest in this slide, my last point was that the quest for realism that was advocated at the beginning by behavioral economics uh, is now turning into the quest for changing people's preferences because they cannot do uh, something else because they kept the standard uh, framework. They started with the endeavor of improving economics by making its assumption more realistic, uh, but it had led to an, another object that is now uh, criticized today as being um, too paternalistic or too uh, problematic regarding the preferences. Why should we care about what people do if we at the same time consider that they know what they do? Just take, checking the time. Okay. Um, so, Andreas, am I good uh, with the time? I think now you have talked for uh, 40, 45 minutes. So, oh, <gasps> really? You're good if it's a we are at the end otherwise okay yeah yeah <laughs> no no okay longer. yeah yeah i have two two slides uh, two more slides yeah simply go on no problem okay okay sorry um, um so now we know that uh maybe i'll just skip this and uh, you can ask something if you'd like but uh, basically i just wanted to say that now it's kind of acknowledged that behavioral economics is kind of mainstream, um, uh, but there's a problem with formalization in standard economics because uh, we keep thinking that mathematical reasoning is uh, crucial. Uh, and so we kind of uh, trapped into this. Um, uh, I think this is something I wanted to emphasize more here. We can see the, this limit, the limit of this weak critique. Um, it's not a radical departure from neoclassical economics. Uh, and what I want to emphasize here is to give you a glimpse of how we can uh, build another kind of model using institutional economics on the case of uh, consumption. So this is basically something I found in uh, um, an American economics uh, article, which basically says, we need to reframe the subject of consumption. Of course, consumers are not just uh, one single agent uh, 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 that uh, make decision making, that make decisions. And uh, even though uh, we implement other inputs, other behavioral inputs, it will stay the same because we need to take into account institutions. Things like the, the fact that consumers are gendered agent, because for example, when you think about uh, the fact that consuming is also because uh, it's also something that 
has to do with the creation of a family, for example, providing for your member and all that. Uh, choice, the, my second point, choice is a social process. Preferences are changing, endogenous, not always consistent. We have individual tastes, meta preference, values, all are changing sometimes. My third point, consumption is not confined in the marketplace. Like Veblen used to say, we don't only consume to satisfy a utility as in standard economist. There are two different aspects uh, in consumption. A ceremonial aspect, which gives prestige and help us shape our identity by identifying to one social group or another. And an instrumental aspect that translates your own taste or satisfaction. When you buy a car, you don't just buy it to drive from a point A to B. It is not just an instrument to satisfy your need, the need to move. It is also a way to express the way you perceive yourself or the way you want people to perceive you uh, buying this kind of brand or this model. And of course, marketing research, again, knows these very well, but economics seems to do as if it, does, as if it didn't exist. And my last point, capitalist is, of course, not the only form of economic. There are many different forms of capitalism. You can look at uh, the work of uh, the regulationist um, Robert Boyer, for example, the French regulationist. Even in, inside Europe, each country has a specific set of institutions, rules, norms, which cannot be compared with other countries. So there's no point in building one big model for all these different contingency. There are historical, cultural, history, institutional contingency. That should, take be, that should be taken into account when we analyze economic phenomena. So, conclusion. A theory cannot be as realistic as reality, of course, but it should be as plausible as possible. Economists have been focusing too much on individual decision-making under constraint, neglecting how agents behave outside the economic framework. The issue of realism of assumption reveals the problematic view of economists uh, on preferences, even in behavioral economics, because they're still attached to the utilitarian framework. Less psychology, more sociology, please. Um, of course, interdisciplinarity is a wonderful thing, but this focus uh, on psychology has led to a problematic um, position of economics, the problem of the unified model to represent the agent. The question is why economics is so obsessed with having a unified representation. My answer would be probably because of the general equilibrium quest that is still shattering on the discipline. If the agent is plural, thanks to the sociology, to sociology that we can uh, assert, we cannot have an idea if we don't, uh, if we consider the agent of plural, as in sociology, we cannot have an idea of how market exchange uh, occur, occurs and thus we cannot understand how markets at the aggregate level will behave. How will, uh, how will the demand and the supply behave? For almost 200 years, this has been the main task of economics, to predict how price will affect demand. But this is my very last point. Economics is a social science. Its goal should be to explain social phenomena. And the example of consumption shows that we cannot or just say consumption is an economic object. No, it's a social object. We need to study with economic psychology, anthropology, and sociology. And I will stop here. Thank you all, and I'm looking forward to hearing your, your question. Thanks.